So this is chapter 23, Poverty and Homelessness, and um, if you can imagine, uh, this is a, a very vulnerable group, a group who does not have a stable home, and um, you can imagine all of the problems that they run into. So we're going to describe the social, political, cultural, environmental factors that influence poverty, discuss the effects of poverty, discuss the effects of homelessness, and explain nursing interventions for working with um, people in poverty and with people who are homeless. So I would like you to take this chance um, to stop this and view Waiting for the World to Change with Diane Sawyer. It's dated. It's from 2007, I think. It is a YouTube video. I will put the link on Canvas. I hope you'll watch part of it. It shows Mooresville, I think it's Mooresville, New Jersey, the best place to live in the United States compared to Camden, New Jersey the um, the most dangerous place to live in the United States and uh, it shows um, the effect on kids of homelessness and other issues of poverty uh, it shows um, I think um, two little kids um, and the struggles that their families go through and the and the dreams that they have and the hopes that they have and um, it's just uh, very eye-opening and um, I wish we could watch it together, but unfortunately, um, due to the trip, we don't have the time. But I hope you will take the time to watch that YouTube. And again, the link is in Canvas. So uh, we've talked about um, poverty in some ways, but we're going to really talk about it. And again, the poor, homeless, pregnant teens, and the mentally ill have very complex needs. And... Um, and they are vulnerable populations. And again, we have to step back and understand our own beliefs. <clears throat> Excuse me. What are our feelings about working with people who are homeless? What do we What do we think about them? How do we deal with them? Uh, sometimes they ha they smell bad. They don't have a shower, so they smell bad. Sometimes their clothes are are dirty. They don't have a washing machine. How are you going to wash when you hardly have any clothes to change? How are you going to wash? The clothes that are on your body, and so they there's there's barriers to to uh, wanting to help and wanting to get close to people um, when they're <coughs> excuse me when they're in difficult conditions of of um, you know not being able to change their clothes and not being able to to bathe themselves and to feel you know. Um, clean and healthy and so we have to identify their health care needs we have to identify the barriers to their care and we have to identify the services that they need so the definition of poverty depends on what the source is the federal government set poverty guidelines they are inaccurate they have not really been changed they are not up to date with what people need um, would you consider that internet is critical uh, if you say no, then think about the limitations that children would have connecting to their school, connecting to um, books online, connecting to resources online. Um, but you know how expensive a, a cable bill is, how expensive an internet bill is, how expensive uh, phones are, and we consider those almost necessary parts of our life now. But the Federal Income Poverty Guidelines don't take that into account. They're very low levels of uh, money. Um, you know, if if you make a certain amount and you're and you've got three people in your family, you are not considered in poverty, but you really can't live a life on that amount. So we have TAMF again, T A N F, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, which can help people by giving them um, uh, checks to help with financial assistance. And again, it comes from federal and state money. We've talked about this before. This is another reminder. That is a resource most people um, have heard about. Social workers are very helpful with getting people connected to uh, TAMP. Then we have WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, which are supplemental food. We have Head Start, which helps with early education. Um, so it's not daycare, but children can go there all day. We see that at Casa del Carmen. Um, there's programs. They watch their height, their weight. They measure things, and uh, they follow um, standards for developing their reading, their, um, their thinking, and you know, they're kid preparing them for kindergarten. But again, the Federal Poverty Guidelines sets the income 
according to your family size, the age of the head of household, and the number of kids who are less than 18, in order for you to receive a certain amount from TAMP. When we have crisis poverty, we have families that are in a situation of hard hardship, uh, they struggle, um, but it might just be an episode. You know, uh, dad broke his leg so he can't work, and uh, mom has to go to work, but she can't make as much as dad. And so uh, we have a family that's making some money, but it's temporary till dad's leg gets better. Excuse me, he has physical therapy and he, and he goes uh, back to work. Persistent poverty are those individuals and families who remain poor for a long period of time, who grew up um, in poverty and who uh, remain in poverty. Perhaps related to uh, poor education, related to um, teen pregnancy, related to um, other issues, uh, unemployment, depending on um, training and things like that. So they are in persistent poverty. Um, it's almost a way of life. And then we have neighborhood poverty, where we have um, high pov poverty areas. We have housing that's coming apart because people don't have enough money to fix their houses. How can you fix your roof if you can't afford to fix your car, to get you to work, if you can't take the bus, um, things like that. Now we talk about their unemployment rate being 5%, which means that only 5% are unemployed. But we know that there are neighborhoods where people are not making a decent wage, a living wage, where they can live on um, on um, the salary that they make. And so we have to remember that people may be working, but they may be um, the poor, and they're, and they're working poor. They don't have insurance. They're not making enough um, to get ahead. Okay, so poverty is decreased earnings, um, uh, unemployment rates, changes in the labor force. So if you have a car factory that goes out because of robotics that come in, machines can do things faster, safer. <clears throat> you have a group of workers then who need to, to learn new skills to join a different labor force because the car manufacturer is gone. Uh, we might have female heads of household. We have people who have inadequate education, perhaps because of their school system, because, perhaps because they dropped out. They lack job skills. Um, there might be weak enforcement of child support statutes. So if women are head of households and the fathers are not paying anything to support the family and nobody's going after their um, wages if they're working, uh, that can lead to poverty. Dwindling Social Security payments to children whose parents have passed on and then um, increasing numbers of children born to single women. This is an interesting game. Write it down and um, play it. It shows you the cycle of vulnerability. Tuesday's group will go through a poverty simulation uh, at the end of March, uh, actually the week after we get back from spring break, to learn about the difficulties people have. But this game is a little thing online that shows you, you know, so, so you need to pay the rent. Are you going to live closer to work? So you don't have to drive. Are you going to live farther away where it's cheaper? But then you have to drive. Uh, and the choices, you know, no, there's no wrong decision, but it's the people, the decisions that people make and then the difficulties that they get themselves into. So poverty affects lifespan. They have higher rates of chronic illness, higher rates of infant morbidity and mortality in poverty areas. They have shorter life expectancy. They have very complex health problems. So they have diabetes and then they have loss of limb and then they have um, retinal damage and blindness. And so we have a complex situation here. We have um, physical limitations from the chronic diseases and then they have hospitalization rates three times more than for persons with higher incomes. I have a friend who's um, been a nurse practitioner for many, many years, just went into a um, medical home out in Lancaster, and, and there is a team of people who work together uh, for these high-risk um, uh, patients who are using uh, hospitalization, using it up, and they are working to try to 
prevent them from going into the hospital because hospitalization is so expensive. And so they work to monitor the blood sugar at home with home visits and talk about the food and give much more intensive uh, treatment and, and, uh, and levels of prevention to prevent the hospitalization because of these complex cases. It's a very interesting model. It's not a new model. It's what visiting nurses have always done, but it's being viewed as the new um, medical home. Uh, interesting instead of home, uh, you know, nursing. Uh, it's called medical home. So I just think it's interesting. So then. Um, we know that poverty can lead to homelessness because if you hardly have enough to um, pay your rent, you can um, be evicted. If you you know you can lose your home, and it's hard to know exactly how many people are homeless because how can we count them um, every 10 years? People move back and forth, move with family, move with friends, have housing, lose housing. So it's very hard to get a grip on what this issue is but we do know the definition and you should know this definition that a person who lacks a fixed regular and adequate address is considered homeless or has a primary nighttime residence in a supervised publicly or privately operated shelter for temporary accommodation okay so a homeless person lacks a regular address or lives in a shelter so take a look at this list. You can imagine that there's probably more, um, including impetigo, including um, you know salmonella from eating um, you know things out of a, out of the trash bag. Um, so, but these are some of the effects of homelessness on health. Um, where are you going to store your insulin if you're homeless? Where are you going to store your medications if you have HIV or if you have TB? And so situations can become worse. There's a lot of alcohol abuse, smoking um, in, home, in uh, people who are homeless. And so um, you can see this list and imagine the levels of prevention. Um, you know, trying to prevent homelessness by um, teaching budgeting and, um, you know, uh, working with people to keep kids in school to break the cycle of poverty so that they um, can go to school, go to a better school, get in the lottery and, and get into the, um, the schools in the city that um, have uh, good teachers. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to say that, but there's schools in Philadelphia that lack lack resources. Teachers don't have books. Kids can't take books home. Kids don't have laptops. Uh, they're limited in their learning. And um, all of that can lead to that cycle of poverty. So the role of the public health nurse, you've seen this before. This is the, the role that public health nurses work with homeless population, uh, excuse me, with vulnerable populations. Create that trusting environment. Show respect, compassion, and concern. Use their names. Use respect. Remember them. Work with them in the long term. Develop a network of support for yourself because, again, a um, lot of issues, a lot of frustration of working with um, um, the vulnerable populations. But this is a slide, so remember the type of work that nurses need to do with vulnerable populations. So that's the end of the talk about poverty and homelessness. There's one um, more section on Chapter 25, Domestic Violence, and that will be the end of the lectures. Thank you.